It's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Stephen Trimble, uh, who I'm honored to introduce, uh, not only because he is a member, uh, affiliated member of the Utah, uh, University of Utah Honors College and a writer and an author and a photographer, uh, but also somebody I'm lucky enough to count as a friend uh, and a colleague on a local nonprofit. Uh, so please join with me in welcoming Steve Trimble. I'm going to turn on a lavalier here. So how does that sound? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. That sounds good all the way to the back? Great. Thank you, Lincoln. Thank you to all the organizers of this conference and all of your hard work. And thank you to all, for, to, thank you to all of you for coming. Because this is a slideshow. I still call these things slideshows. We're going to bring down the lights so you can see the pictures in all their glory. You don't need to see me. Here's where we start. And here's where we end up. These are cartoons by Roz Chast, a New Yorker cartoonist, brilliant New Yorker cartoonist. And they pretty much summarize all the issues in the national parks. And they also bring in this idea of photography. I'm going to talk to you today about pictures, about photography. Here are my credentials. This is me in 1960 <laughs> at Yellowstone. I am an editorial photographer. I tell stories with photographs, and I've been doing that ever since I was a park ranger in my 20s, beginning now 40 years ago, which is terrifying, and in keeping with Bob Kiter's dedication of the conference to Joseph Sachs, I want to dedicate my talk to the mentors I had at, at the beginning of my uh, relatively short career as a seasonal park ranger, Bud and Mary Lou Hanafee at the Ho Ranger Station in Olympic National Park, where I worked as an SCA volunteer in 1972. Bud taught me the joy of being a park ranger. And Jim Carrico, who was superintendent at Great Sand Dunes, where I began my work as a writer and photographer for the Park Service, who I still would say is the best manager I've ever worked for. But I've only had one full-time job ever, so maybe that's not such a great distinction. So I moved on from that little box camera to use 35 millimeter cameras throughout my life, trying to tell the stories of the places I love. And that often involved national parks. And this is the photograph that I chose to put on a, uh, the cover of a guidebook to national parks called The Bright Edge. And that's the title I used for this talk today. I still like that term so much because it, it captures the feel of being out there on the bright edges of the world. It comes from a quotation by Willa Cather, a quotation from Willa Cather's Death Comes for the Archbishop, where she talked about the sense of the air out there at the edges of the bright edges of the world, uh, a feeling, a, an arom aromatic sense that you don't get anywhere else. So we're going to go out onto the bright edge and deal with these same issues that we deal with over and over again. Here we are entering Arches National Park and trying to figure out that balance between enjoyment and preservation but we've only got 10 minutes. <laughs> so as a photographer, my job is to figure out how to take a picture of delicate arch that doesn't look like every other picture. And I chose to hang off the backside of the arch and take this picture where the arch is mirrored by the cloud. But I didn't include all the hundreds of people on the other side who are fighting about whether or not they should take pictures at all. I have given you nature I've given you the virgin North America. I've given you the old-fashioned version of nature photography that my friend and, and uh, bookseller and thinker Jose Knighton has described as eco-porn, where nature is airbrushed. We've airbrushed all of the people, all of the faults, everything out except what's left, sheer beauty. What should we do as photographers in the national parks? What is our mission? Well, I'm going to go back to those same words that we heard this morning that we'll hear again in the course of this conference. Every naturalist, every interpreter, every storyteller, every photographer has to work with those words to conserve but to leave unimpaired for the future generations. In the 1970s, we went back and expanded those words to talk about the cumulative expressions of a single national heritage benefiting all the people of the United States. They're great words. They're words that I suspect 
Congressman Rob Bishop or Representative Ken Ivory in the state legislature may have read but would not interpret in the same way that, that all of you probably would interpret them. So I wander out into the landscape trying to capture the sense of relationship that people have with that landscape. And one of the best ways to do that as I wander behind my children in national parks is to just see where they go and what they do. And they almost automatically connect footprints from my daughter, footprints from seagulls on the beach at Cape Cod. I take every picture I can think of and each one of them tells a different story. But if I add a person to that picture, I think I've managed to accomplish a little bit more of what national parks are all about, creating that relationship that we have when we go to those places. Kids are great, and they, they take up the loose parts that Aldo Leopold told us to save, and they do things with them. And I follow along and take pictures of what they do. <laughs> Every picture I take, I'm trying to, to figure out how to tell the story of this place. The questions I'm asking are, what does the story look like? And it may look like the reflections off of that wall of desert varnish. I may become an art photographer very enthusiastically and abstract the cliff face completely, but maybe that doesn't tell the story as well for the first time visitor. It simply becomes an abstraction. When you come to these big landscapes and national parks, first you have to grapple with the newness of that place and figure out what all of that space and time means to you. I think there's a lot of overlap between interpretive photography, editorial photography, and conservation photography. And photographers have been working in all of those realms ever since William Henry Jackson went to Yellowstone in, in the 1870s with the Hayden survey and brought back photographs of Mammoth Hot Springs and Yellowstone Canyon and Old Faithful to show to Congress who decided, partly on the basis of the strength of those photographs, a place that they would not likely see, to set aside our first national park. And so photographers have been intimately involved in working to preserve these amazing places on our public lands, our national heritage. When we began to realize that we were losing our big trees from the redwoods of Northern California to the sequoias of Southern California, we began to set aside pieces of land to preserve those trees. And photographs played a part in that, including Ansel Adams' photographs that were largely responsible for the creation of Kings Canyon National Park in the 30s. When the Cascades began to suffer deforestation and clear cutting, David Brower, the executive director of the Sierra Club, invented what he called battle books, those large format Sierra Club books of the 1960s, and made sure that a copy of every one of those books landed on the desk of every member of Congress. His biggest triumph with Sierra Club books and the power of photography happened at the Grand Canyon in the late 1960s when those books and the Sierra Club under David Brower stopped those dam proposals and soon after that Grand Canyon National Park was expanded. Brower sent the great photographers of the day, Elliot Porter and Philip Hyde, down the river to capture what Elliot Porter called intimate landscapes and to bring back those pictures and put those pictures in books that everyone could see. Philip Hyde's pictures were a little more expansive, a little warmer. I had the chance to interview Philip Hyde when I was working on my book about Grand Canyon photography, Lasting Light, and I interviewed him just a few months before his death, and he told me that in a picture like this of a beach along the river in Grand Canyon, what mattered most was what was outside of the frame because even though he was an artistic photographer and cared a lot about what was inside the frame of that picture, what was outside of the frame could destroy everything inside the frame. And he really defined himself as a conservation photographer. So I'll go back to my own pictures for the rest of the show here and talk about change. You know, what is the story of national parks today? What is my commission as a photographer to, to tell whatever story the, the park or the interpreters ask me to tell. At a park like Joshua Tree National Park, in a few years we may, not have, we may have no Joshua trees at all. You know, with climate change, these parks set aside for particular species, particular ecosystems, they're bound to change. And we can't stop that change, it's already in place. In a Joshua Tree, we may be going back to the Choya Forest in the Creosote Bush Flats, but there may simply be no Joshua trees. 
The same thing could happen at Sequoia National Park. You know, we may do our best to preserve the Sequoia ecosystem in some way, but we're going to kind of have to go with change, too, and whatever wildness presents itself with, in, to us. Obviously, glaciers retreating is another major aspect of climate change, whether at Mount Rainier or Glacier National Park or Glacier Bay. And Jim Balog's Extreme Ice Survey and the documentary film tracking his work, uh, Chasing Ice, are amazing examples of the power of photography to document climate change in the national parks and all over the world. Sometimes climate change brings us new resources. In 2005, the levels of Glen Canyon, the levels of Lake Powell in Glen Canyon dropped so low that I was able to take sea kayaks with my family and paddle in to the cathedral in the desert in the Escalante arm of Lake Powell, a place that I had seen in those Sierra Club books photographed by Elliot Porter and Philip Hyde in the 1960s, and a place that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Several people this morning mentioned and emphasized that national parks and the national park system tell the story of people as well. The history of thousands of years of occupation of these places as homelands by native peoples and pioneers. And today there are Indian people living in national parks and around national parks and managing national parks and working at national parks. The Park Service manages those monuments on the National Mall to tell the story of our history right up through our paralyzed Congress of today. The Park Service manages battlefields and all of the stories of the Revolu Revolutionary War and the Civil War along the East Coast and the immigrant paths across the continent. So as a, as a photographer, what am I going to look for to take pictures of history? Well, I often look for signs because they help me a lot, like this little monument at South Pass which is a very subtle place on the Continental Divide where the Oregon Trail crosses over into the West. Or I'll look for the inscriptions left by those pioneers at Independence Rock along that Oregon Trail national, national uh, emigrant path. When I go to a place that's been photographed so much, that's so symbolic, the Liberty Bell at Independence National Historic Park, I look for other ways to photograph in that place. And I'm not so sure that I'm just having a good time and not necessarily telling the story as effectively. When I get all excited about Independence Hall being reflected in the mirrored dome of a garbage can or seeing the, the windows of that lovely building refracted through the colored water at the little shop run by the Natural History Association, perhaps the best way to tell a story is to take pictures of storytellers themselves. Perhaps the best way to capture the, the cultural dynamism of uh, the Fiesta at Tumacacri National Monument is to catch that decisive moment of a young dancer. At a place like Teddy Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, there are many stories to tell. There's the story of TR coming and working out of the Maltese Cross Ranch Cabin. There's all the natural history involved with the North Dakota Badlands. There are, there are iconic wildlife species like the bison and you can make a case that the prairie dog is actually even more important as a keystone species in that environment. There are a few parks where I've, I've spent a lot of time. I worked at Great Sand Dunes, I told you, as, as a ranger, and that's where I worked on my first 32-page interpretive booklet for Natural History Association. And I've been photographing there ever since as we've reprinted the book over and over and needed new pictures. And the, the challenge of taking one photograph that captures the whole story of a park is a, is a wonderful challenge for a photographer. We used a version of this picture, a horizontal version, for that very first Great Sand Dunes booklet, 700 foot high sand dunes at the base of 14,000 foot peaks. Now we could have chosen to emphasize the sweep of those 30 square miles of sand dunes, or I could have gone back up into the mountains above, which have been since added to the park, and captured the lush greenery that you can find up in the Sangre de Cristo range. Or maybe I just follow my son again and see what he does when he leaps off the top of a dune when he's about 10 years old. To tell the story of a park often involves context. And several parks to me are all about context. One of those being Great Basin National Park. When I drive out from Salt Lake across the West Desert, I start on dirt roads, past Crystal Mountain, 
head down those big booming Great Basin Valleys in the middle of nowhere, and then transfer out of my truck and onto a footpath leading me to the summit of Wheeler Peak, where I stand at the, the summit of this huge mountain in the middle of nowhere, and I have a sense of what I'm looking at when I look out in every direction across the Great Basin Desert. And then at the base of that mountain, of course, are the world's most ancient individuals, the bristlecone pines, growing to 5,000 years old. And an enormous part of that story that we're trying to tell. Point Reyes National Seashore. What does the story look like? Does it look like the waves rolling in against the bluffs? Or is it most important to think about the animals that have to cope with those waves and tide pools? Or can I be more impressionistic and photograph the uh, Point Reyes light on the headlands at dusk and turn the ocean into mist? The most successful photographs are often pictures that kind of capture everything at once. And this is a picture from Acadia National Park. And I've got the old rock of the Scudic Peninsula and that lovely crystalline, crystalline water of the main coast. And I've got a lobsterman checking his traps. And so I'm, I'm communicating a on a lot of different levels in a single picture. Similarly, in Hawaii, nothing says Hawaii more than the creation of new land. As a lava flow pours into the ocean, and as each new dribble of lava hits that water and crystallizes, we enlarge the scope of the island. I've spent more time at Capitol Reef than any other national park. I think of it as my home park. I was there as a ranger in the 70s. I still have a little house just outside of Torrey. And again, this, this picture to me says Capitol Reef, but it's a picture that I took many, many years to snag. And along the way, took all kinds of other pictures to tell the story of the idea of Capitol Reef, as Paul Shaleri talked about the idea of Yellowstone. When we created a little book about Backcountry and Capitol Reef, we used this picture on the cover, a detail, a reflection of a pothole, trying to capture history and wildlife and landscape in a single picture at the campground, or pure light bouncing off the cliffs. I can, I can choose different stories to tell as I go through time, as I go back to Capitol Reef over and over again, looking for the tracks in mud of a passing bird trying to capture the spirit of raven. You may go for a whole day and see no other living things at Capitol Reef other than ravens flying down those canyons. Trying to tell the story of erosion in a single picture where I've got the wind blowing away sand grains from that sculpted rock in the foreground and the big cliffs in the background showing you the power of water. I can encounter an old juniper tree up at the summit of the water pocket fold and I can photograph the tree in context or I can turn the, scree the tree into a sculpture and work with that. Or I can simply put on a telephoto lens and bring the Henry Mountains up close and make you feel like this is an even more dramatic landscape than it is when you stand there. Anywhere on the Colorado Plateau, I'll be trying to tell the story of water. Water that comes at its most forceful and powerful in summer thunder showers that create waterfalls booming down over the slick rock, pouring into the rivers, those rivers carrying away the debris that's been pried off by the ice and storms of winter, downstream headed for the confluence of the Green and the Colorado rivers, downstream headed for the sea, looking out from Grand View Point over the confluence, the heart of the canyon country, and eventually all that water, all that forest headed for the Grand Canyon, 270 miles long, the Grand Canyon. How do you photograph a piece of landscape that large and capture it? Again, you're photographing time and space. It's really a fool's errand, you know, filled with, with side canyons. I think photographers tend to gravitate to the side canyons like Havasu and the Grand Canyon simply because the canyon itself can be so overwhelming. We keep redefining words these days, and I want to tell you a couple of stories of how I've been grappling with those words recently myself. The idea of remoteness came to me when my wife and I and a cousin of ours drove to the very southern edge of Capitol Reef National Park, where it bumps up against Glen Canyon. And we headed south on dirt roads and kept turning off dirt roads and off of those dirt roads until we'd taken our Subaru as far as we could 
and started walking on a broken down road and then a path and then across to the edge of Hall Mesa where you look out over Halls Creek Narrows, probably the most remote place in Capitol Reef National Park. And as we gloried in that place and as I did everything I could think of as a photographer to capture what it felt like to be in that place, I realized that kind of dead center in that picture, you're also looking down here at Lake Powell. And we were within line of sight of Bullfrog Basin and we had cell phone service. And so I could stand in this remote place and call anyone on the planet. So what does remoteness mean today? How about the word wilderness? Here, my wife and I and some friends are gonna walk down through Orderville Canyon, down into the Zion Narrows. It's a 12 mile hike. You're in designated wilderness. It's an incredibly beautiful place that requires some scrambling and even some canyoneering. And it leads you to remarkable beauty and real wildness. But you're not alone. You know, there are 80 hiking permits issued every day for Orderville Canyon. And there were Boy Scout troops sweeping past us and small groups of uh, canyoneers considerably younger than us who had come down through much more difficult side canyons. And you get down to the junction of Orderville Canyon and the Narrows and the number of people start to increase. And once you're in the Zion Narrows themselves, you're surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of people who are having the experience of their lifetimes. And they're not all middle-aged, gray-haired white people as so many of us are in this room. There are all kinds of people wearing all kinds of footgear from flip-flops to Crocs to hiking boots. And they are in designated wilderness and they're trying to figure out what that means. Just as all these folks in another Roz Chast cartoon are trying to figure out where the next Emerald Pool is as they follow their trail guide. So what is wilderness? What is wildness? To figure that out, the, the National Park Service is always working on interpretation. I think, I think of interpreter as an incredibly honorable word. I was a, an interpreter before I was a professional writer and photographer. I'm not really an academic. I still think of myself as an interpreter. And I went poking around in Park Service websites to see how they define interpretation these days. And this is what I found as the definition. And these are big, abstract words that are really difficult to make sense out of. And I, I yearn for the one-syllable and two-syllable Anglo-Saxon vigorous words that E.B. White would want us to use in a situation like this. So my, my challenge to you over the next couple days is to see if you can do better at defining this incredibly powerful thing that park interpreters, that conservation photographers, that editorial photographers do when they interpret wildness for us. Walk, walk down that canyon and, and pay attention and think about, okay, what are my connections with this place? What can I see? What story can I tell? What idea can I absorb? What experience awaits me around the next bend? The reflection in a pothole. Don't forget to look behind you. Don't forget to look up. You never know what you might see when you look up in that sky. That red tail would probably let you know that she was there, in this case, if you did look up and, and see her. And you'll find that you're perched on the edge. You're perched on the rim of time. You're perched in the present and looking back at the past and looking into the future and trying desperately to figure out what it all means. And as we move into that future, we find ourselves grappling with, with these meanings. And I, th I think we're moving away from the word unimpaired toward the world, word wildness. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a fine book published by Bill Tweed, who was the retired chief naturalist at Sequoia National Park, called Uncertain Path. And at the end of that book, Bill Tweed took, took a crack at rewording that organic act language. And he tossed out the word unimpaired and emphasized the word wildness. And this is what he came up with as the, the, um, the mission of national parks, which I equate with the mission of an interpreter or a photographer. You know, to preserve wildness and to preserve as much as we can, because we're not going to preserve all of it, that biological and cultural heritage 
and allow for enjoyment, but make that enjoyment sustained and respectful and non-consumptive. And somehow, some version of national parks are going to go on into the future. So here we are, looking out from Bryce Point, imagining elegant conservation, as we heard this morning, imagining what wildness can be as we move farther into the 21st century and on into centuries after that with the national parks, our incredible heritage in America. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I can take a couple questions. Do I have time? Okay. Yeah. Oh, we have to start switching. We have to start switching computers too. It isn't really the kind of talk that lends itself to questions particularly. But if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Steve, uh, I know you've worked with wide format and 35 millimeter and all sorts of other stuff. How much manipulation did you have to engage to make the program today? Uh, it depends on what you mean by manipulation. Uh, I, I try to make my pictures look like the place looked to me. And so I might have increased the saturation and contrast a little bit because I know that I'm yeah, showing I noticed them that, but what, what I was asking, Steve, is with the different formats, how much did you have to do to get it to be presentable on the disk? Oh, I see. Like, because I'm working with Kodachrome slides from 40 years ago. Is that what you mean? Yes. Um, you can scan anything and turn it into a digital image. You know, I still think in terms of slideshows, and I still find myself talking about slides, even when I'm talking about digital images. But, um, you know, e everything can be turned into a, a lovely digital image. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. Uh, I've seen your pictures for a long time, but your language is even more beautiful than your pictures. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. How about one real I, question? I have a question. Um, you know, one of the things that we've uh, determined in some of our research uh, is that photographs of wild places without people is actually a turnoff uh, to certain ethnic groups, um, that, that we continue to produce uh, calendars and publications and all of this stuff about wild places without people in the picture. And I, I'd just like you to, you, you alluded to it a, li a little bit in photographing your children in there, but I, when you talk about the role of photographers in connecting the next generation to these places, I'd like you to comment a little bit about adding a person into those photographs. I think it's incredibly important. And I like pictures that allow you to become the person in the picture. And I had a picture of someone's legs cut off. You know, the legs were sticking into the picture. You can imagine that they were your legs. And you could imagine yourself in that place. And um, I, I think it is so interesting that People in my generation came to national parks and wilderness in the 1970s and went backpacking and grew up on those Sierra Club calendars and imagined our, ourselves in solitude in those places and so as young white guys. And, uh, you know, Hispanic people or Indian people could never imagine being in any of those places without being there with their families and in large groups of people and enjoying that place connected to family, in context with family. And so I think we need to pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, I recommend, in thinking about millennials, I recommend a really interesting blog post on grist.org within the past couple of weeks, uh, written by a young woman who basically was explaining why she doesn't identify herself as an environmentalist, but yet cares about all of the issues that we all care about. So we have to change our language and talk about people and photograph people and pay a lot of attention to generational differences and cultural differences. And it's a great challenge. You know, it, it keeps, keeps us nimble. So I encourage us all to keep thinking in new ways. Don't fear change. Embrace it. Thank you.